All right, everybody, welcome to Virtual Bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. We have a fun event tonight. We have not only our signature uh, virtual bourbon event, this is the all-star edition of that. So these are literally your favorites. So what we did, of course, the previous year, it started literally at the beginning of COVID. We decided we had to do some online events. The first thing that we came up with was this idea of our flagship whiskey, where we we uh, put four distillery representatives in front of a group, had them share their signature whiskey and, you know, talk about it and, and then lead us on a tasting. And it just, you know, was a hit from the very beginning. And we decided after a year to go back through everybody who bought a ticket, we gave them the chance to vote and tell us what their favorites were. So we took uh, the top 13 uh, of those uh, original 48 and uh, they are our all-stars. So we're going to be doing this for the next three weeks where we're going to be uh, highlighting 13 different distilleries from year number one of our flagship whiskey. So very fun stuff. Before we get started, I'd like to run through uh, and introduce you to all five of our presenters today. And of course, this is going to be the order that we will be interviewing them and tasting the whiskey. So if you don't have your placement, you're not set up, this is the order that we'll be going through. We're just going to say hello to them and then we'll come back around and do our interview and of course the tasting. So we're going to be up first is Ryan Thompson, founder of 10th Mountain Distillery. He's got this distillery in Gypsum, Colorado. He's got a tasting room in Vail, Colorado. He is joined by his distiller, Jeremy. Hey guys, what's up? What's up, Steve? Nice to have, nice to be here, bud. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Congratulations on being an all-star. And uh, we look forward to learning a little bit more about the great things that you've got going out there in Colorado and uh, tasting some of your whiskey tonight. Okay. Amen. Talk to you in just a little bit. Of course, the next guy, uh, all-star, he blew us away uh, when he came on and literally told us some of the great stories. The stories were so good. We did an event where he just came on and told stories to us. So literally our next guest is Mr. Greg Snyder, the master distiller for a chicken cock. Hey, hey, Greg, how's it going, man? Hi, Steve. Uh, as always, thanks again for uh, allowing me to be a part of this this fun evening. So yeah, absolutely. So glad to have you here and be a part of it. And yeah, we'll talk a little bit of whiskey stuff. And we always like hearing what you have to say. And uh, yeah, those that stuck around for the event after the event. Uh, it was unbelievable. So yeah, just some great stories. And, and we love uh, hearing all the great history you have in this business. So it's very, very cool. So we'll talk to you in just a little bit. All right. Yeah. Uh, next up is Mr. Royce Neely. He is the founder of Neely Family Distillery in Sparta, Kentucky. Hey, Royce, how you doing, man? What's up, buddy? So I'm uh, looking forward to talking to you. You've got a, a special item for us tonight. It's an all-star event. You wanted to bring something a little bit different. So you've got a new product you're going to be tasting out for us, correct? That's correct. Yep. It's kind of the, the first uh, people to get a, a really a crack at this other than uh, those early birds that came by the distillery. I mean, this is really literally out this week, right? It is. Yep. We just uh, just put it up, what, three days ago, Becca? Yeah. yeah, very exciting, very exciting. All right, we'll talk to you in just a little bit. All right, next up is my buddy, uh, the distillery closest to my house, the one, uh, now I never want to do this, of course, because it takes uh, about 10 minutes to drive there, but if I had to walk to one, if things came so bad I had to walk to a distillery, I could make it to his place. So my buddy, Mr. Adam Stump over there in Columbia, Illinois of Stumpy Spirits. Hey, Adam, how you doing, man? What's up, Steve? Not much, buddy. Looking forward hey, to make talking sure to you. Yeah. Make sure uh, you don't walk across that bridge. They might, uh, might call for a jumper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would have to hustle across the, the bridge. <laughs> I, I'd move so fast. I, 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 I'd be there before you know it, but yeah, I look forward to, to chatting with you. I, I tell you what, uh, if I, if I did walk there, I'd be thirsty. So we'd have to get the drink <laughs> for sure. We can keep you hydrated. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. All right, and next up, of course, is a good friend as well, Mr. Caleb Kilburn of Kentucky Peerless out of Louisville, Kentucky. Hey, Caleb, how you doing, man? Steve, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Congratulations on uh, All-Star nomination. That is really cool. And, you know, this is literally the best of the best. So look forward to uh, talking to you and all the great things that you've got going on as well, too. All right, buddy? Hey, this is some amazing company, and thanks so much for considering us. Absolutely. So fun stuff. We've got a great event lined out. Again, we want it participative. So please, when it comes time to share nosing notes, tasting notes, please take advantage of the chat function. I'll, uh, I'll pick those up for you or... Uh, our distillery representatives, we'll see them as well. And we're going to start with our buddies out in Colorado, Mr. Ryan Thompson and his distiller, Jeremy, out of 10th Mountain. Hey, guys, how's it going? Hey, my man, thank you for having us tonight. My name's Ryan. I'm the founder of 10th Mountain Whiskey and Spirit Company. To my shoulder, he right or left because of uh, Zoom stuff. But it's Jeremy DeWitt, one of our uh, distillers that helps us make all the great whiskey that we're enjoying tonight. 
Yeah, it's going to be going to be good stuff. Very much looking forward to that. So, you know, tell us a little bit about, you know, what's like visiting your distillery, because uh, the folks on these events, they love coming and visiting distilleries. And if they're going to be making that trek out to Colorado and some may be coming with us, of course, we're filming a movie next year. You're going to be featured in that. Uh, we do have some of our, our uh, fans and stuff are going to be traveling with us. So uh, very much looking forward to that. So what can they expect if they come visit 10th Mountain? Man, we're looking forward to uh, shooting some of that video out there with you next year, having a good time with that. And and I got to be straight up with the audience. Jeremy and I are coming with uh, you guys from Louisville, Kentucky tonight. We reached out to Caleb that's on the, on the call. Uh, Caleb and I and uh, Peerless and Tenth Mountain Whiskey were one of the first ever uh, uh, classes from Moonshine University to graduate from 2013. So I uh, just want to give a shout out to those guys. And Caleb and I have been on text a little bit. Uh, we're excited to be here to, with you guys tonight. So just want to give a shout out to that before we get into anything else. Yeah. Well, you guys are uh, really great, uh, you know, testaments to the great work that they do at Moonshine University. I mean, two uh, individuals doing some really great things in the business. And uh, yeah, so they, they, of course, doing some, some great stuff at Moonshine University, a sponsor of the ABV Network. So we certainly appreciate them for all that they do as well. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Good, good we got off the plane today in, in Kentucky and Louisville about 3 p.m. And we went straight to Moonshine University just to check in with them, say hi to those guys and then uh, continued on. So um, but uh, to your point, uh, what we have going on out in Colorado, although we're not there tonight, we're here in, in Louisville for the American Craft Spirit Association Conference. Uh, but uh, we just got here this afternoon, but we reside in Vail, Colorado, and we're named in honor of the 10th Mountain Armed Division, uh, which, one, which was one of the original uh, divisions in the 1940s to uh, fight in World War One, World War II, excuse, excuse me. And uh, uh, in our area, they were originated in our area. And then when they came back and wanted to share the mountain lifestyle with uh, everyone, they uh, started Vail Mountain, Aspen Mountain, Steamboat Springs, and that's one of the reasons that we're here today. So that's why we're naming in honor of those guys. So, yeah, and it's been a great partnership that you have uh, with Tenth Mountain. Of course, it's a division that still exists today, and you do have active duty members as well as uh, you know veterans that come by and, and see what you're doing. Just check out uh, what you got going on at the distillery. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the things that's near and dear to our heart is to support the military no matter what division. Uh, we're named in honor of the Army Division, but uh, Marines, Air Force, Navy, you name it. Uh, and so we uh, honor them every day. Just a couple of days ago, we donated a bunch of money to the Wreath Project. Um, no matter what, it's something that's near and dear to our heart every day that we do and uh, in, in what we have going on, so. Yeah, yeah. So. And, you know, it's, it's great that you guys, you know, have this, this tie to the history of the area and things like that. But you also, one of the great things about what you guys do is you support so many different, you know, uh, military uh, projects and, and charities. So tell us a little bit about the charitable work that you guys do, because I think that's a really important part of your story. One of the most important things this past year that happened was our fourth infantry project. And the fourth infantry reached out to us a couple of, uh, months ago, maybe about 12 months ago, and they were uh, raising money for a monument at Fort uh, Benning and outside of uh, Columbus, Georgia, uh, to raise a monument in honor of the 4th Infantry. And we did a special barrel pick with those guys and raised over 11,200 bucks, 250 bucks. Uh, and without us, they said that their monument wasn't gonna be raised. And so uh, after that happened, there were some very significant things that we were honored with, that we were recognized with. And it just, it's one of the very small things uh, on our radar that uh, we support uh, in regards to our whiskey company, uh, because we just always wanna uh, recognize the different military nonprofits and give back to those that have given so much to, to what we do, so. Yeah, yeah. So, and tell us a little bit about, you know, your product lineup. I, I know that, uh, of course, you make whiskey, and that's what we're going to be trying tonight, but you make some other products as well. So tell us a little bit about what we could find if we're out visiting you, because I, I know you've even got a new one, too, that's that's out. Yeah, Steve, to your point, I think uh, our American single malt is over your shoulder uh, on our screen. It's over your left shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that's one thing that we just launched a couple months ago. 
Um, we started lying that down about three years ago. And uh, it's something that we're very proud of. Uh, it's, it's a category that uh, was coming up uh, uh, a couple of years back. And so we started lying down barrels of single malt and are really happy with that. We have uh, Tenth Mountain Brandy, which is made with uh, Monterey Valley, California, uh, Pinot Noir. And uh, we've been, that's been very well received. So we're excited to release that as well a couple months back. And so we'll, uh, we'll see where things go. We have a couple of things lying down that uh, we're not uh, talking about yet, but things are, <laughs> things are happening. So you'll, you'll, you'll tell me first though, when, uh, when someone can know, right? You know that, man, you know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. I want to get that out in the old quick bourbon notes and, uh, you know, share what's going on in the industry. We love doing those sort of things. So tell us a little bit about the whiskey that we're going to be tasting tonight. You know, well, how did enjoy our yeah. Tenth Mountain Rye tonight? Yeah, yeah. So you got your you got you got your rye it comes in at ninety proof. So tell us a little bit about this one. And it looks something along these lines in our fifty mils, and it's a uh, it's a uh, seventy five percent rye. I'm sorry, sixty nine percent rye, thirty one percent corn, four percent malted barley. So it's a higher rye content, uh, but it, it's uh, it doesn't have a huge uh, uh, spirit. It's 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 sixty five percent rye, so it, it's a lot of rye out there. A little higher rye uh, content, and ours is uh, very well received in the aspect that it's a little more smooth. It's a little more well received on the palate. It's uh, eighty six proof. It was just awarded uh, the whiskeys of the world. Uh, rye whiskey, uh, a best in class. And so um, on the nose, if you don't mind, I'm going to pour on myself. Sure. Heck yeah. And Steve, while you're nosing, tell me what you get. Yeah, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, it's explosive on the nose. There's a lot going on there. Really great. I'd say baked apples is a, uh, a one that you really get on the, on the nose. Um. That's really interesting. Yeah, baked apples, I think you nailed it with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, really excited about taste this one. What's anybody else getting on the nose? You certainly can, can share that uh, via chat and we'll share that with the team there. Anybody else getting something of, of note? Fruit cobbler. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that's right on kind of a, kind of same a lot of people get a lot of salmon up front, you know, it's kind mm -hmm. of traditionally with the rye. Um, if you want to go a little bit deeper, you're going to get some dark fruit. I think maybe we're, what you were hitting at, Steve. So mm -hmm. butter pastry, yeah. So you're getting a lot from the from the bakery aisle here. Bread pudding, sweet yeah. spice, yeah, banana. Asian American New York barrels are number four char is where we're at. So uh, nice. nothing out of the ordinary necessarily. But uh, one thing that makes us unique is that we're aging at 6,800 uh, foot in altitude. So yes, um, that has a lot of effect on things. So. It does. It does. And we've seen that in some of your uh, offerings. And uh, of course, Bill and I, uh, we, we did the best we could to, uh, you know, drain this uh, barrel that you had that it fell into the hazmat range. And uh, last time Bill was out there, he's holding it up. If you, if you can see Bill Lewis on your screen, he's got the, uh, some of the last of that in that jar that he's held up, just as dark as motor oil on the screen there. Really good stuff. Uh, just amazing, actually. Uh, we've got a, a podcast coming up, uh, Jim Fosnott, who's my buddy here. We did a, a, a remember, the, Jim, this is the, the guy who made the stuff that we tasted there. If Jim, you want to take off mute and tell, tell a little bit about your experience just tasting that stuff. That's literally probably the best craft whiskey I've ever had in my life. There you it was go. spectacular. There you <laughs> go. And, uh, and our, our buddy Scott, who's going to business with us, uh, would, uh, would second that and Steve third it or first it, whatever. Yeah. But it was unbelievably good. And we were trying to sneak the rest of the bottle away from Steve, but he yeah. wouldn't. wouldn't uh, when he left, when Jim left, I was packing up a bag of all the stuff he had to take. And I put that bottle in there for a second. He didn't say a word. His eyes got as big as saucers. I'm like, I'm just kidding. I'm not giving you that. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> so, I, gonna, yeah, right. I thought you made a good friend, Steve. My, my bad. Yeah. Uh, fantastic, though. Yeah. Uh, Greg wanted to know about the size of the barrel. I, you said uh, char, uh, number four, but uh, did you say the size of the barrel? Or, yeah, the majority of our barrels are 53 gallons. Okay. Traditional cans. Uh, we do have 30 gallons, 10 gallons, and five gallons as well. Uh, but the majority of our barrels are 53 gallons. Uh, Steve, when you and Mr. Bill visited a couple months back, you saw the rack house, uh, the racks there. So, uh, but uh, yeah, the majority majority of what we have is uh, 53 gallons. So, yeah. 
Uh, you got the notes here, herbal tea, a little bit of bitterness from the fresh mint leaf. I'll tell you what spearmint you're getting. I, this is a sweet uh, apple up front as, as you get, but man, that, that rye spice kicks in and, uh, and it sticks with you for a little while. It's, it's impressive, my friend. And that's what I love, Steve, is the spice that kicks in and, mm -hmm. and it lasts. That's where, that's where we go. If you come to our Taste Room in Vale Village and you ask one of our uh, bartenders, what's your favorite? What, what do you gravitate to? Nine times out of 10, they're saying the 10th Mountain Rye, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I could really see that breaking its way through a cocktail. I, I mean, it's it's really yeah. uh, amazing, and it just it's a sipper though. It's gosh darn, that's good and great time of the year to be enjoying a nice spicy rye like that. So you know, I I, I like the spicier uh, ones in the in the winter time. So even though we're not really winter here right now, it's like seventy something degrees here today. So but, hey, and yeah. it's chilly. So I'm <laughs> in Louisville right now, which is kind yeah. of warm as well. But in mm -hmm. Vail, it's chilly, and then the ski season has started. So yeah. Uh, last question. Uh, it looks like uh, I assume that's Patrick. It just says PL there. But uh, what's your oldest stock of this particular recipe? Patrick's going to make an offer on a barrel, apparently. Steve, you can answer that because you uh, have a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is that? Uh, getting ready to turn seven years old. It was uh, yeah, six, six, exactly. and, yeah, it was six and change. Six and yeah, about yeah. six and a half when we gave it out to you. So, yeah. Mr. Bill was out at our uh, distillery this past summer. And then uh, we pass along a couple of bottles to Steve, and it was a six and a half year old rye, and I think it was at 148.9 proof. Yeah, right yeah. It's uh, beautiful. So that's the oldest bottle we have in the house right now. Yeah. And although it took a lot for us to uh, uh, pull those bottles for for your stash, Steve, uh, we still have one or two, three bottles in the barrel that are hanging on, uh, and so they're they're still around. So to answer the question. Maybe a seven-year-old ride at this point. So nice, very nice, very good. Well, Ryan, uh, please stick around, and, and Jeremy too. Please stick around, and uh, we'll bring you back at the end for Q and A. Good. Okay. Cheers. Yeah, you got. It. Thanks, Steve. All, All right. right. Next up is uh, Greg Snyder of Chicken Cock. Hey, Greg, how you doing, man? Good, Steve. Doing great. Yeah, good. Good talking to you as always. So. Tell us just a little bit about, for those who weren't on the first time you came on or didn't get to attend the stories event, which they should have, but it, not you know, that one sold out so quick. There may be people on here that didn't get the opportunity to do so. Tell us a little bit about your history of the business, because that, that's what's so interesting. Well, I've been doing it a little while. Uh, I actually started uh, right out of college. Uh, I have a business degree from Indiana University, and uh, right out of college, I went to work for Joseph E. Seagram so when I had a a facility in Louisville in 1978. So I've been in the business uh, over 43 years now and in a variety of capacities, a variety of companies. Uh, you know, when, when Seagram shut their uh, Louisville operation down and consolidated, they were going to move into New York City to corporate offices. And I said, thank you very much, but I'll take the severance package. And <laughs> so uh, uh, with the severance package, they paid for my MBA. I got my MBA in a year's time. Uh, which they paid for 100 percent, which was great. Yeah, then I went to work for Brown Foreman shortly thereafter. Worked for Brown Foreman for uh, gosh uh, over 12 years. Nine of those 12 years, I actually managed our cooperage operation. So I've not only made whiskey, aged whiskey, bottled whiskey, but uh, I've also been involved with the most important 60 to 70 percent of the flavor uh, in the bottle of whiskey. It actually comes from that white oak barrel. So um, from there, I went to uh, Pernod Ricard. Pernod Ricard owned Wild Turkey at the time, and I was their vice president of, of Austin Nichols and the managing director of Wild Turkey for a little over 10 years. Uh, from there, I went up to Maine and worked for a company called uh, uh, White Rock Distilleries. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Uh, privately owned company. Um, uh, when I was up there, the biggest brand we had was Pinnacle Vodka. Uh, we mm -hmm. actually created the dessert category of, of uh, flavored vodka. Uh, but was up there three years, and then Jim Beam acquired uh, the Vodka Pinnacle and, a, and another small rum brand and, and the plant assets, and they asked me to move back to Kentucky and head up the transition of those brands back into their Frankfurt facility. So I did that, took a little over a year, and then I left and went to work for a company in, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, called Western Spirits. I was a VP of operations uh, for a little over three and a half years. I was actually living and working uh, down in Bowling Green during the week and driving home on weekends uh, to where I live in Southern Indiana, right across the river from Louisville. So, um, so yeah, Ryan and you and Jeremy aren't too far from you. You're probably about a 10 minute drive from me, I'd have to say so yeah. uh, this evening anyway. Um, 
did that for three and a half years and it got kind of kind of rough uh, uh you know working down there during the week and coming home on weekends and just got more difficult so i decided to ramp up my retirement plan and that was not retired but start my own consulting company so about four and a half years ago i got into consulting business and, and picked up a number of uh, clients early on uh grain and barrel spirits who owns chicken cock whiskey was actually one of those uh one of those companies i picked up early on and been been working with them ever since so um, I've been very blessed. This, this industry is a great industry, a, a lot of amazing, wonderful people uh, that I've met over the years and have uh, become friends and learned from. And so uh, I've been very lucky. Yeah. If you don't mind, tell the story. Uh, we won't get on all your stories because there, there's a lot of great ones there. But real quick, tell the story about uh, Russell's Reserve, because I think that most people assume that brand is all, uh, you know, from concept to delivery, uh, everything was done by the Russells because it's got their name on it. And, you, you know, you, you would assume that that's, that's how that came about. But that's not really how that brand got started, was it? No, the, the, the truth is I actually created the brand when I was managing director as a tribute to Jimmy Russell. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned earlier, Pernod Ricard owned Wild Turkey when I started there. And hell, I hadn't been there a couple of weeks. And, and uh, uh, top management of Pernod Ricard came to me and he said, hey, we think we have too much aged whiskey. Would you mind looking at our inventory? And, and tell us, you know, if we have too much whiskey. So I said, well, first off, I need to know what your sales forecast are going forward into the future. And uh, so they said, well, figure 2% on all the brands for the next three years. I said, well, that's great, but you got some 12 year old brands. I need to know out at least 12 years what your sales forecast are. And that way I can figure out what, what you're gonna use and not only what you need, but what you need to lay down for future um, uh, you know, needs for inventory. So. Anyhow, I, I did the math. I have a liquidation distillation model. You guys were talking about Moonshine University. I actually teach a, a class there, Ryan, uh, uh, called uh, Age Education. It's on barrel maturation and, and uh, warehouse management. Within that Ryan, class, I actually kind of- Can I interrupt you? Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Man, I was just talking to Colin at Moonshine University this afternoon about you. I didn't realize that you're going to be here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So anyhow, within that class, I actually kind of show that uh, uh, that it's just an Excel spreadsheet, that liquidation distillation model, I call it. So anyhow, after I did it, I plugged in the numbers and came back. And I said, well, you know, had a meeting up in New York uh, at the corporate office in New York with the top brass and uh, told them, I said, you know, you don't have too much whiskey, but you got too much older whiskey. And they said, well, how can that be? And I said, well, it's easy. I said, you got your finance folks up here in New York City telling the distillery what barrels to pull for the 101, for the 80 proof, for the rare breed, for the, and, and so, you know, they're doing it all based on cost. And so six and a half, seven years ago, you lay down a hell of a lot more whiskey than what you're bottling today. And, and for the Wild Turkey 101, which is about 75, 80% of their, their total volume at that time, um, you know, they, they were, uh, they were using six and a half year old whiskey. Well, Another year come around, the finance guy says, well, we can't use that seven and a half year old whiskey. You know, that's another year older. You got more alarm taxes. It's, you know, more evaporation. And so the component cost is going to increase. And I said, you know what, guys, you have to bite the bullet. Number one, that decision of picking the barrels to use has to come down to the distillery. Okay. More on a quality basis. And, and they'll keep, you know, the, we'll keep the cost content, component cost in check. But there's no doubt about it. It's going to increase the component cost. So anyhow. That was one of the things we had to do to use it. We started using some older whiskey, blending it with the six and a half to kind of use up some of that stuff. But I said, that's not going to use it up in a, in a long, long time. Second, you can try to sell aged whiskey. Well, aged whiskey was not in the market back in, uh, it was in 1998. And so uh, I said, but the third thing you can do is uh, create a new bourbon brand. And I said, you know what? It's high time this company paid tribute to one of the greatest master distillers that ever walked this earth. And that's that's Jimmy Russell. And, uh, you know, I had the, the CEO, actually had the, the president of, of Pernod Ricard was in the room too, uh, but I had the CEO, all the finance guys, the, the CFO, uh, marketing folks. And they said, that's great. That's a good idea. What do we call it? I said, well, for lack of a better, you know, better name, well, we call it Russell's Reserve. It has a nice ring to it. They said, yeah, that's yeah. fabulous. So anyhow, Jimmy didn't know all this was going on. So I worked it out with uh, the marketing folks and finance folks, and we developed the packaging on it. When it first came out, it was actually in the tall original wild turkey bottle yeah uh, and it came out at 101 proof and it was screen print had gold screen 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 print on it, it said wild turkeys russell's reserve and um, a couple years later we had a new marketing group come in and that's when they put it in the squatty bottle shorter bottle and, and uh, came out at, at 90 proof but um 
you know, I, I told Jimmy I, the next Monday I got back from that meeting was on, on a Friday and I got back to, to Lawrenceburg. I said, Jimmy, I said, you know, the company's looking at coming out with a new brand. I said, we got some pretty good 10 year old whiskey, as I recall, up on the fourth floor of B Warehouse. You get time today. How about grabbing a sample of that? Let's look at it. I said, OK, yeah, I'd be glad to. So I had a meeting with the union that day and, and we were wrapping things up and I hear this knock on the door and, and this Jimmy and he opens the door and says, Greg, he says, you mind if I come in? I said, no, come on in, Jimmy, we're, we're wrapping up. So he brings this little snifter glass to me. And I mean, I got it a foot from my nose. And I mean, the caramel vanilla just knocked my head off. I just couldn't believe the aromas. And this is 10 year old wild turkey bourbon. You know, wild yeah. turkey has one, one mash bill, basically 75% corn, 13% rye, 12% malted barley. But the, the aromas just was phenomenal. And, uh, I looked at Jimmy and he gave me that little grin, you know, and, and, and so, man, I took a sip of it. I said, wow. I said, that's pretty good. I said, I said that thinks, that's what we're going to use for this bourbon. So, again, Jimmy didn't know anything about this was going to be called Russell's Reserve till later on. We we did a little presentation and, and he shed a couple tears over it, but he's pretty proud of it. And they've done a phenomenal job with that brand. It's uh, it's doing well and, and uh, you know, they're serving up the great whiskey and for the price. I don't think you can find a better oh, yeah. price. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible value. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's doing, doing well. And, and, and pays tribute to one of the finest men that ever worked in this industry. Yeah, for sure. So Chicken Cock, obviously a historic brand that has been brought back. One of those great stories of bringing back something that, uh, you know, was was a big thing. And, and Chicken Cock wasn't just a, like a small look. That was a, it was actually a really big thing at one point, right? It, it was. It was a very popular. had a very high quality reputation. Uh, for those that don't know, Chicken Cock actually originated in 1856 in, in Paris, Kentucky. Well, it's, it's actually 100 years older than I am. Uh, earlier, we were talking about some birth dates. So um, uh, I'm not, I don't quite go back. It was a 42 or 43, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, Paul, it is 100 yeah, Paul goes back to 42. So yeah, right. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, but um, so yeah, it's an old brand and has a lot of neat history. Um, one of the things when prohibition hit, of course, the distillery in Paris shut down and the brand was actually sold to a company in Montreal, Canada. And they actually produced a, a, a Canadian rye whiskey, and they would bottle it uh, in the chicken cock bottle under the chicken cock label. And then they seal it in a tin can because that tin can protected it when they bootleg it back across the border in the <laughs> U.S. And it showed uh -huh. up in a lot of speakeasies, but it's one of its claims to fame. It was actually the, uh, the house whiskey at the most famous speakeasy, the Cotton Club in Harlem, New York in the 1920s. Yeah. Uh, so uh, kind of tied into that. Just last week, the last week, uh, last couple of weeks, we just bottled a commemorative bottle of that uh, of that era, the, the, the hundred year. I guess. Yeah, I saw it. it comes in the tin and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it's uh, it's got a neat com uh, commemorative tin uh, as well, kind of very similar to the original package, uh, almost identical to the original package actually. Only back then it was a pint bottle. This is a 750 mil, um, and it's uh, it's a, a 20 year old Canadian rye that's going to be hitting the market very soon. So. Yeah, that's really cool. Very cool. Well, what are we going to be tasting here tonight? We got your bourbon. Tell us a little bit about what we should expect as we get to this. Yeah, one. so uh, again, kind of tie back to the story. When I got involved with uh, uh, Grain and Barrel Spirits, uh, the founder of the company came to me and, and asked me to serve in the role of master distiller because he had a vision. He wanted to resurrect the brand back to Kentucky. Uh, the distillery burned down in the 1950s and the brand just sat idle uh, until about 2011. 2011, the founder of Grain and Barrel Spirits actually acquired the brand needed cash flow and he started making some flavored whiskeys and some young whiskeys and it served its purpose uh, to create cash flow, but it didn't really bring back uh, the high quality prominence that the brand once had many, many years ago. So uh, Monty, the founder, he had this vision and he shared that vision with me and asked me if I'd serve in that role. And I said, I'll do that on one condition. We stop bottling this young stuff, this flavor stuff, and let's truly really focus on building the brand back to its, its high quality promise. So, um, the first step of that, we entered into an agreement with Barstown Bourbon Company, um, and that's where that's the home of Chicken Cock Whiskey right now. That's where we're making our bourbon and our rye whiskey currently. Uh, we started actually laid the first down in 2018. So, the first ba barrels we laid down of bourbon is not going to be um, at least four years old till next year, next August. And so that's when we'll start bottling. In the meantime, part of why I do is I go out and I try to find good aged whiskey, good quality aged whiskey that we can put and bottle in the chicken cock label to kind of bridge that gap until ours becomes available. So what you're drinking tonight is some, some, some good Kentucky bourbon. We've been able to acquire this is our chicken cock, Kentucky straight bourbon. Okay. It's 90 proof. And for those that haven't seen the package, I, that too. I don't know if you've seen, you see this, this is actually a replica of the pre-prohibition bottle that chicken cock was bottled in. Uh, 
Uh, it's got honeycomb pattern. It mimics chicken wire on the outside of the bottle. But, um, but this bourbon we're drinking tonight, 90 proof. And this is actually a blend of six-year-old and 15-year-old. Okay. Yeah. Boy, it's really good on the nose. It, uh, that's a delight. Kind of a creme brulee-ish. Love the bottle. Bubble gum on the nose. That's really getting the sweet stuff there. Oh my God, let's give it a let's give it a try here. Cheers, gang. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that is really really solid. Uh, I like the mouthfeel of it. It um, it is really uh, coats the palate nicely, and it's cherry pie and marzipan. There you go. There you go. I, I definitely get the fruit to it, so I can see where he's come up with that for sure. It's, yeah, uh, I think it's just, you know, with the 15 year old, it has just enough of the, the, the oak characteristics really got mm -hmm. to uh, enhance and, and complement some of the other caramel, vanilla, and oats. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Flower? Is that what they meant there? Flower? I don't know. Flower up front? Could be. But uh, yeah, we are really good. What else? What else is on the, on the taste here? I'm sorry. Look. Definitely get some, uh, it sticks with you kind of the center of the palate too. I mean, kind of upper roof of the mouth and the tongue. So that's nice. Anything else you guys taste in there? Here comes something br br brittle. So that's always good. Gotta love that. Spice cake. Adam Stumpf. This is good with uh, about six, seven O's there. Um, Bright and lively, the finest fowl, as in chicken whiskey ever. Grandma's apple dumplings with ice cream, that's pretty good. Great finish, sticking around. Bill, uh, oh, Mr. Bill says I like it. That's the highest rating that you can get. That's equivalent of a perfect score in most uh, situations when he says I like it. So yeah. he doesn't really into the tasting notes of that, but if he says he likes it, whoa, wow, that's big. You may want to use that in your marketing, Greg. <laughs> Put Bill a picture of Mr. It. Bill on there. I like it. Mr. Bill likes it. There you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So leather almond. Yeah. Yes, correct. Six and 15 year old. Very nice. Well, Greg, uh, appreciate you bringing some really amazing whiskey here and uh, really good stuff. And I uh, love what you're doing, my friend. Thank you, pal. It's, uh, you know, I'm excited. As you know, you know, we, uh, I taste our whiskey that's aging right now every six months. And, and it's, it's just, it's progressing so great. I'm, I'm just, I can't, can't wait to, to bottle some of the stuff once it gets at least four years old and, and you know some of the details that i'm not going to get into tonight as far as right. you know my oversight of selecting the logs and really uh paying attention to the barrel from the very start to the very finish and, and so uh but i think everything we're doing is is, is paying off um uh you know other people have tasted and validating um you know the, the flavors that we're getting so i'm excited to, for the future yeah absolutely and we got to get together and play some cards so uh Greg, like yeah, me as a I card player, buddy. I'm sorry. I, I, I keep like inviting. I've always got some yeah. excuse, but yeah. uh, but I'd love to connect with you, and, and we'll do it one of these days. Well, our home base is Bourbon's Bistro, so we like playing there. So uh, Greg's also a fan of that. So between the Great two, place. poker fan and Bourbon's Bistro, yeah, cool. it's it's a must. So, all right, sample every six months for every six days. Uh, yeah, uh, just let me know next time you're doing the sampling thing. I'll I'll be sure to help you out, Greg. I can carry your books or whatever you need. So, yeah, would love, love to have you come down. With me. Yeah, <laughs> All sure. right. Next up is uh, Mr. Royce Neely of Neely Family Distillery. Hey, Royce, how you doing, man? What's up, Bankley? Not much, man. Things are looking good. You're at your your house there. So, of course, Royce, uh, you know, it, what, he's got a beautiful home. Looks like a, a, a rack house. Uh, his wife, Becca, really kind of designed it, uh, of course. And then his father, of course, is a, was a local builder uh, for, you know, I don't know, 30 years or something crazy, Royce. And, uh, yeah, yeah, been putting this together for him. So just really, really cool situation they've got up there in Sparta. So very nice. Tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on at Neely Family Distillery, because there's always a lot happening. Uh, uh, so many, uh, you know, exciting things. So tell us about some of the, the cool things that are going on right now at Neely. Yeah, so uh, we're uh, staying really busy up here. We uh, have really committed to the uh, two stripping uh, runs a day, two cooks a day. So we were kind of playing around with it, but now we've been running for the last month, month and a half on that doubled up scale. 
Yep. Uh, so it's going really well. And that also is now allowing us to plan out for the future if we want to take the facility uh, to not only another ship, but then to run it 24 hours a day. We think we can actually get possibly up to three uh, full runs of those in at a time. So uh, it's, it's been interesting. Uh, and uh, really, I think all we have to do to do that is drop in just some more fermenters. So I've got a place lined out out there to where if we get to that point, uh, we're going to drop in uh, another fermentation room. Yeah, yeah. That's getting to be a thing with uh, some of our buddies here. Yeah, more fermentation rooms and stuff like that. So cool. Uh, and tell us a little bit, uh, an update for you have a second distillery that you're getting ready to open up, your mountain distillery. Kind of takes you back to your roots, the family roots. So tell us a little bit about that and when do you think that's going to be opening up? Yeah, so... Uh, we're getting, I know every time you guys, a lot of you guys have been following this for a while, every time I say, yep, we're getting a lot closer, we're getting a lot closer. So we're getting the floors done now. So, I mean, we really are getting a whole lot closer. Uh, we got pushed back from the flood and various other things, but, uh, you know, it, uh, we really got it the way we want it. We, we ended up gutting the entire building. So we kept the, uh, the structure, uh, there, but we went on and we ran all the electric, all the plumbing, all the sewer, I mean, we redone everything, uh, decided to actually dirt all the insulation out, spray foam, insulate everything. We insulated up underneath the floor. So, I mean, the facility is gonna be top notch uh, with that old school look, obviously the building itself uh, provides. Um, I think that we'll get it open. Uh, we'll do a soft opening January, February-ish, and then we'll have Matthew down there full time, probably with mom and dad as well at that point uh, in March. And I think we'd like to open up for March for the rush for that area. Obviously. It's a big, big tourist destination for those that don't know that area. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of equivalent to, I don't know, uh, you know, like Branson or something like that, a little family outing. And of course, it's really geared more towards outdoor activities. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, rafting, canoeing, hiking, all those type of things, right? It is. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the cool thing and the reason why we chose that area, it's a 10 minute bird's flight from where my great grandfather and my grandfather ran moonshot at illegally. Um, and I have a lot of family members still make it on the illegal side down there in the mountains that are going to be able to, I don't know if this is going to be a good thing or a bad thing yet, but they're going to be able to come up there and hang out at the distillery. Uh, so and tell a story, <laughs> you know, reminded me, I saw the, the image that, uh, Elaine stole posted of Dick at the, uh, at the bait shop, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I imagine a look of that, that the mountain distillery on Mondays and Tuesdays with some of the old timers hanging out there. That's, that's kind of the, the look I, I, or the image I get in my mind. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's a cool thing. You'll be able to have the, the family there and uh, yeah. And, and like I said, it's a little bit different audience. It's a couple hours away from your, your distillery where you're at right now. And you are doing some different things. You're, you're going to be releasing a, a four-year-old bottle and bond moonshine uh, there when you get that open. So that's pretty cool. And of course we uh, promoted that. We did use some of that for a fundraiser that we did for our buddy, Michael Stallings, uh, who's been struggling with health issues. And that really was a, a very nice thing that uh, you were involved in. I'm glad to be involved in it. Uh, you know, we're also going to run down there a little bit different. Uh, we're going to be running open flame with a really traditional pot still. So it's going to look like a moonshine still that was literally drugged right out of the woods and run in there. And I think that's going to give people a cool perception of the area. Like you were saying, hey, we're still going to make some bourbon on it, but mostly moonshine focused down there continue our bourbon production up here in Sparta. Yeah. You've got a great big picture window too, that uh, is going to highlight uh, back to the Creek and stuff like that. So you'll have kind of a historic setup there too, right? Where you can kind of see how, how things happened back in the day. Correct. That's right. Yeah. We're going to pull the water actually out of the Creek to mash with um, probably not to cool with, but definitely to mash with. So when you walk in, there's a, I think it's 16 foot long by eight foot tall window and the still sets there in front of it on a Creek rock, uh, laid foundation or laid floor so if you look at it the right way it looks like the still is actually set in the woods so you can take a photo with it and actually look like you're in the woods with the still which i thought was kind of neat very cool yeah so tell us a little bit about uh, what we're going to be tasting tonight because this is something very different for you like i said this is a new product that was just released this week so tell us about what we're going to be tasting here tonight yeah kind of funny it was flagship whiskey but i decided to go with brandy for this one but you know, we were, we were talking Akeley and just so happened that uh, I was getting close to bringing out that brandy. Uh, it, it was cool the way this happened. So we're talking back in 2017. I just actually got the distillery open to the public. We've been distilling some on site, all of it moonshot at that point. And I get a call from uh, the local winery down here in Carrollton, Kentucky. It's about 15 minutes away from me. And they said they had a different assortment of wines. Uh, they wanted me to come up there and try them, but they had an allotment of this wine that they couldn't use. There wasn't nothing wrong with it, but they had severely overproduced at the time. And I guess they had lost some distribution or something. They, anyways, they needed to get rid of this wine. And uh, they were like, 
you know, come up here and try it. So I went up there, I tried it, and uh, they were like, if you want it, you know, you, you can have it. Oh, okay, that sounds great. So me and Papa all took uh, my dad's old <laughs> Dodge truck, and we got two uh, plastic 270-gallon uh, IBC totes, and we drove over there and got the wine and brought it back, and I think we made two or three trips, and uh, we started distilling on it. I really liked the wine, so I, I merged. It was white and red wines together, and we merged them before we distilled them. Um, and I actually kind of liked the flavor of it after we blended, I guess you call that blending and wine, after we blended those together. I did have, and I didn't know a lot about brandy at the time. I did some research on it, and uh, I really liked what Copper and Kings was doing. And I knew I wanted to double distill it, but I didn't want, I didn't want it to be altered at all. So I made a really good, and a lot of brandies, a lot of times the, there's more heads that can be left in them, especially traditionally distilled. I cut a lot out of this. All right. And then I distilled that brandy on down actually to 96 proof. So the final distillation come out at 96 and we entered into the barrel at that proof. So it's, it's still proof. And then when it come out of the barrel after aging, after four years, we, we aged it lower in the rick house. Um, it actually come out at that 91 proof. Yeah. So we added no water to it then either and uh, decided we were going to take it uh, as a single barrel offering. So single barrel, barrel strength and still strength, which I thought was a, a cool way to try brandy just completely unaltered. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Uh, anybody who hasn't seen that yet, check out their Instagram, Facebook pages and see it. The branding is really cool on it. Gave it a very old look, kind of a kind of a ripped label type of thing and uh, just old graphics and stuff. It's, it's very, very cool for sure. We found an old uh, George. So George T. Stagg actually made brandy back in the, I think this was like Latin was the distiller there at the time. So we, I got a bunch of old labels and one of them was this really cool George T. Stagg brandy label. And we decided we wanted to use something like that to come up with our label. That was kind of the uh, inspiration behind it. Yes. Yeah. No, it's actually aged in. So it's aged in used 10 year old Kentucky bourbon barrels. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's uh, give it a taste here. I mean, on the nose, I mean, that's buttery goodness, right? I mean, I got a lot of pear from it personally. Mm -hmm. Pear, yeah, I can see that. White grapes, cookie dough from the Murph. Murph, the Murph. All right, let's let's give this a taste here. Let's see what we got. Oh man, that is really nice, brother. Thanks an orange blossom. Yeah. Oh, no, I was gonna say two, two barrels is what we got out of it. So we have two different single barrels. We decided I decided not to mark them individually, just let people figure it out as they try them. See if you can taste the difference in them. Okay. Nice. Yeah. They um the the the, the taste is just dynamite, man. It's uh it it really has got a thick viscosity to it. I mean it's it's and that comes from bringing her, you know, bringing that proof on down at the distillation is what brings a lot of that, obviously, that viscosity and everything over with it. Um, it was just, you know, you know, this actually wasn't something I was ever planning on continuing on with. And I actually tried Lenny's. Lenny sent me a bottle of his brandy, and I was like, man, if my brandy could come out even close to as good as Lenny's is, Lenny's is phenomenal. Uh, and then when we got to try, and I think we tried it the first time, actually, what, two years ago? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's really changed a lot. Uh, in that two years since and it was actually Tony Minchella was going out there and playing around with some of our stuff and tried it he's like I think we need to pull it now before the oak influences influences it too much you know we were afraid that we didn't want it to have too much of an oaky taste we wanted to let uh, the wine uh, shine through as much as we can yeah some great comments here Lenny says yours is better by the way so he's actually on the spend I guess he's on page two I don't see him but uh, yeah so apparently he's on here he says yours is better um, pleasantly oaked. Yes. Um, uh, I like Evan Van Skoik's. I'd imagine this is what a barrel aged champagne might be like. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. I think that's, that's yeah, right on. It's held a single barrel name. Yeah. Uh, raisin and orange blossom. I, I get some of the orange blossom on the taste too. That's, that's listed on the nose, but I'm getting, I'll just definitely get really, that on the taste. You know, for brandy, for something that wasn't designed to be distilled into brandy, you know, it was a wine that, you know, it wasn't like the grapes were selected or anything was done to it to make it uh, a mash or a wine for a brandy. I thought it, I thought it come out pleasantly well. I'm really happy with it. Unfortunately, our friends didn't survive during COVID uh, down in Carrollton and they closed down. 
So that's going to definitely be the end of, uh, of this branding. At least this oh, really? That is, yep. is that the guy who I saw at the distillery one night when I was there after hours? Yes. Yeah. So I met Royce's distillery. I used to, I used to stay there because I didn't have money for a hotel or anything like that. So I, I, and Royce had a bedroom set up there, but he wasn't living at the distillery. So I would just stay at the distillery all night. And one night I'm there alone and there's a knock at the door and I what the heck is going on? So I go up there and check and I'm talking to the guy through the door. I don't want to open the door and I don't know who this guy is. And uh, so I talked to him and uh, I guess he called Royce the next day. He's like, dude, I got to quit drinking. I went up to your distillery last night. It was closed, but I think I saw Santa Claus in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta stay off that stuff is what he's, yeah, yeah. he's like i just had too much drink i, I swear there's santa claus in there santa claus there. Yeah, like, there you go that's not the only person that you're distillery. it's probably santa claus so that's that happens apparently so <laughs> yes santa claus all right uh royce excellent job here i i really like this and I, it's cool you brought something you know very different for us and uh, again, first first chance to uh, taste something a little bit different from the story there. So thank you so much, man. Please stick around and we'll talk to you in just a little bit, okay? Thank you, guys. All right. Next up is my buddy, Adam Stumpf, who runs the adult daycare that I attend. I like to go over there and uh, hang out with Adam and talk whiskey and uh, you know maybe drill in a couple of barrels from time to time. Adam, how you doing, man? I'm good, Steve. Yeah, that's fun, right? Uh, you, you, you like having me there, right? <laughs> well, quality assurance. Yes. What I do, I try to, you know, because I'm over there and I'm just hanging out, I'm always worried I'm going to get kicked out, but I always go through the closing and, and stuff that they have there, whatever's new in the gift shop. And then I send screenshots of it to Justine and then she buys the stuff. So it's like, I make myself valuable by, by selling things to Justine because she loves all your, your gear, of course. Noticeable sales spikes on those days. <laughs> right. See there, she's wearing stuff right now. So yes. Yeah. That's how, that's, that's the only way thing I can do to kind of, you know, so Laura isn't like, is Ickley here again? <laughs> oh, no, he's over here selling. He's, he's selling. So, oh. so cool. But tell us a little bit about your distillery, and uh, and we'll get to you know the big thing that's going on there in just a second. But tell us a little bit about the history of the distillery first. Uh, yeah, for sure. So we started. Um, I guess I, I was originally a beer guy. Worked at Anheuser Busch uh, right out of college. Uh, decided to graduate to distilled spirits after, or uh, kind of during uh, an MBA program. And um, in 2014, we officially launched the company um, and kind of started taking steps to um, build a distillery that we thought would provide real value to the customer. And um, the way we decided to do that was to tie in our eighth generation family farm. Um, so at that point, we made the commitment to provide every kernel of grain that goes into our process. Um, so for us, that is yellow corn, it's bloody butcher red corn, it's sweet white corn, um, wheat, rye, and uh, we actually grow barley as well that we ship out to Indiana, get malted, and then ship it back in. Um, so basically anything that we can make from that grain, um, we do officially open our doors to the public um, in July of 2015 and um, have been running since. So uh, we started, as many of you guys know, on a shoestring budget. My wife and I own the company and we've kind of been um, just doing what we can and upgrading capacity along the way and uh, feel like we are uh, finally putting in our, I, I guess, uh, what, what I call at least our forever still. <laughs> uh, Laura doesn't necessarily think so. Um, but uh, yeah, this is our, I guess, fourth distillation system. So um, and it, it's all you're, around. You're going to turn really, this into a bourbon must visit place though. So, so what you're going through, right? Tell us a little bit about exactly what it is you're putting in because, you know, bourbon fans love seeing things that are unique and different and you've got something that no one else is going to have. So tell us a little bit about what you got going on there. So I, it kind of starts on the grain processing side. Even um, we use a grain cleaner that was built in 1949 that we refurbished. So we clean all the grain out of the field right there on site. Um, as it comes in the distillery, uh, goes directly over to our triple pair roller mill, um, not a brand spanking new triple pair mill from RMS grinders or something like that. Uh, this chunk of cast iron was built in 1898, uh, came out of a grist mill um, by Six Flags St. Louis property. Uh, we refurbished it and uh, we actually ran it uh, the other day for the first time. Um, we ground, it, it ground about 150 bushels an hour through that thing. So it was, uh, I mean, it was cruising. Um, but super cool. We're running it on an old flat belt still, um, just crazy stuff. Uh, but the big thing is, uh, we, we purchased a, um, 
for lack of a better term, a pile of scrap metal <laughs> from a company in Belgium. And uh, we shipped two shipping containers of stuff that we thought we might be able to turn into a distillery uh, over here. And lo and behold, we had a diamond in the rough. Uh, so basically we, we acquired the entire assets of a distillery. Uh, the equipment was built in 1922. Um, it was a Grain Jennifer distillery. The Ewalds uh, are holding Belgium. it up. They got, they got some of the stuff behind you there. So, What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Hold of the Ewalds if you want to see what that looks like. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there it is right there. Um, so, yeah. So, basically, uh, we started installing this thing. We took three of their stills and smashed them together into one. Um, the big thing is the 28-inch stripping column we're putting in. It's all copper. Um, it's, it's all riveted together. So, uh, pretty crazy to think that this stuff was built when they were riveting ships together scared the hell out of me when we fired it up the first time I thought every rivet was going to be leaking but amazingly enough they all still hold <laughs> um so yeah uh put in a, it's a 28 inch stripping column 850 gallon copper doubler and then um we are integrating a barbette style still into it as well um that'll be for our vodka and gin production uh, but should uh, also make some super killer rums for some of our contract clients yeah. Um, and it's really going to allow us to increase our capacity. Um, and this is what it's all for right here. So this is our, um, original, this is, this is 1953. Um, old Monroe is our bourbon that we produce. Uh, it was a bourbon that was produced here on Columbia's main street, starting in 1941, um, and ran up until 64, um, when Glenmore bought them. And, uh, I think, they ended up shipping everything up to Peoria and blended it in, into, uh, I think maybe Hiram Walker at that point in time. Um, but anyway, uh, we resurrected that brand name and uh, that's kind of our, uh, our flagship, if you will. Um, so that, that, that larger column is all around producing uh, more old Monroe. Um, but we do also have um, quite a few things in the works right now with really blowing out um, our contract and private label side of the business too. Um, both on the liquid production side and the, uh, the packaging side of things as well. So uh, I was so there, kind of I was there a week ago and you said that still is going to be up and running in two weeks. That's a week. So are, are we still on track for, for one week? Yes. And that is even with, we're leaving and we're going out of town through Wednesday. Um, our first mash will be on that next Thursday when we get back. Okay. Um, so we, we've taken it through, uh, the preliminary steps right now and, uh, we feel like we're ready to feed the thing. Well, that's exciting. So yeah, yeah, yeah really Super cool exciting. stuff. What a great moment that's going to be again, fabricating all those parts, literally, you know, uh, two shipping containers just full of just a hodgepodge. I mean, I wouldn't know where to begin and, and to be able to take all that stuff, put it together, repurpose some of it and, and change things around just amazing. And then, you know, you got all the modern technology that's associated with this thing now too, to then put all the computer parts to it. So uh, amazing stuff. And I can't wait to see that going. And again, I, I think it's going to be one of the places that if you're a true bourbon fan that you're going to have to get to and see this thing working. It's really unique. Yeah, we hope so. We're trying to to treat this kind of renovation as almost like mm -hmm. a, a bourbon museum. So like the walking tour really shows the history of the different. Have you considered the name Colonel Steve for the, the that big still, <laughs> big oversized yeah. still? <laughs> I like it. I'll put that on the list. Put it on the list. Yeah. So put that on the list. We'll see what happens. All right. Tell us a little bit about uh, the whiskey that we're going to be trying here in just a second. Tell us about what you got for us. Uh, so this product is not released yet. Um, it will be released under our old Monroe name. Um, this is the first product we are going to release as a bottled and bond. Uh, so it is made from 100% soft red winter wheat that we grew on the farm. And uh, it's a super unique bottled and bond because we, we wanted to take a different approach at this right out of the gate. And we thought that the idea of a barrel proof bottled and bond would be really, really cool, right? So um, instead of just going at, you know, barrel entry proof at hundred proof and kind of blending things right there, um, for every barrel of 100% wheat whiskey that we entered at 120 proof, we entered two barrels at 93 proof. Um, and then we blend those barrels together in ratios until we hit exactly 100.0. Uh, and that's the product you have. So basically we've aged all of the, uh, the proofing water to, to achieve that bottle and bond status um, with the whiskey itself. And uh, for these barrels in particular, uh, we were running, uh, these are independent stave 
um, wave stave barrels. Okay. So for those of you that are familiar with those, those are the ones with the grooves ripped in them. Uh, medium plus toast, number one char. I, I thought I really liked the lighter char side of things, lending itself to the nice soft wheat um, and all that. And I, I'm really, really thrilled with the way this, uh, oh, this dude, product- On the nose, developed. this is like oatmeal cookies on the nose, man. Yeah, oh, I, sadly, I don't have any with me, um, but I did write my <laughs> So the, the day I pulled a sample, I actually sat down and did a, did a tasting note. And it's, it's a little bit like a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'll, of course, everybody's going to kind of experience it differently, but uh, just what I had written down is it starts out grainy and not grainy. Like whenever I smell like bourbon and think it's grainy, it's grainy. Like this is what like fresh ground wheat flour smells like. Yeah. like okay. When the mill clogs up and you got to dig the mill out, whenever you're grinding wheat, that's what it smells like. That is exactly yeah. what it smells like. Uh, so it starts like that. Then in the middle, I got all sweets, uh, brown sugar, molasses. Uh, then the finish kind of gets this like surprising to me anyway, but a, a little bit of spice on the finish, um, which is kind of counterintuitive uh, when you're thinking about wheat, especially 100% wheat, um, you know, almost like a, a cinnamon. So, uh, you know, you kind of get the grain, you get the sweet, you get the spice. I thought it was a really nice roller coaster. And uh, to me, I thought it was really neat. All of the the variety and the spectrum of flavors um, that this one grain really kind of showcased. So um, we're, we're super proud of this one and uh, really excited to get it on the market. Yeah, a lot happening on the nose. Butterscotch, maple, pine, mint, blueberry, dark color for wheat. Yeah, definitely dark color. Uh, a lot happening. Uh, warm gingerbread cookie, cardamom on the finish, golden grams. Yeah first taste some orange uh dude it is a definitely layer of flavors for sure thank you and experiences again from from you know sweet to you know spicy it's it's all over the place where can we find stumpies uh, columbia illinois, columbia, yeah. illinois. Um, so we're most of our products are distributed uh in well illinois and missouri um largely the st louis area uh, you can find us big retailers uh total wine schnooks uh, Deerbergs, a lot of the, all the small any ones. any shipping partners? Uh, uh, not yet. We are working on two solutions for that at the moment. What about uh, what about wine and cheese? Do they ship your stuff or not? I know they they were doing it, some shipping. The shipping rules in Missouri are somewhat limited, but yes, they can ship our stuff depending on where you're at. Okay, all right. So check out uh, wine and cheese place. Maybe they. I know they they ship some stuff. And, yeah, and uh, yeah. Benny's does as well. Yeah, Mike Mike's been moaning right now, so he wants he wants some. Yeah, it's it's amazing stuff, and you know I always say the wheat whiskey is you know that's tough to make, and just think about some of the some of the big brands that you try and they're just mediocre. I don't want to say they're bad, but they're they're just not great. They don't ever strike you and be like I got to buy another bottle of this. Whereas this is just great, man. This is good stuff, brother. Yeah, thank you. It's a you know we we kind of took a look at the commercial wheat whiskeys that were out there, and you know they're they're the kind of you'd call it the barely wheat whiskey, right? 51%. Yeah. Uh, and we were like, you know what, let's experiment with it. Let's see what this grain actually does. What does it do on its own? And uh, we, we liked it enough, you know, standing on its own that we said, Hey, we're going to set these barrels back and just kind of let them, let them do their were, thing. Were these the barrels like right inside the doors at the distillery? They were. Yep. Four barrels. Yeah, so right we, we, we've, we've, we've tapped into these uh, several times during adult daycare. So hopefully you have enough left. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Gotta, <laughs> I, I did what I could. Yeah. The, yeah, uh, right. yeah we got a, a bunch tossed out in the ricks as well kind of trying different areas of the rick house now with this one as well yeah bob whitlatch says you got some killer gin too which you won uh best gin when we did uh did a, an event called for the bourbon lovers gin you guys won that so yes thank you guys very blind, much that was blind tasting too so no no bias at all i didn't participate in it. i was just uh the host so that's it won so very cool that's awesome we've got a, i'm super excited about the gin we've got a uh i've got a barrel aged gin that's uh We've got, I don't know, probably three or four barrels of it sitting back right now. It's uh, pushing three and a half years at the moment. So uh, most barrel aged gins are usually, you know, finished for a couple months. And we're like, oh, let's kind of treat this gin a little bit like a whiskey, at least on the maturation side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Adam, thanks so much for joining us, man. Really appreciate uh, you taking some time on your schedule. And uh, I could hear some uh, crying in the background. So Laura's probably stressing out right now. But uh, uh, I don't, maybe that's a good thing for you. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm working. I can't I can't help. <laughs> no, it, it's quiet now. So the little one must have a bottle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. All right, buddy. Stick around and uh, we'll keep you around for the live Q&A at the end. All right. Cool. Thanks. All right. Next up is my buddy, Caleb Kilburn. Caleb, how you doing, man? Hey, thanks for having me. 
Absolutely. So glad to have you here. And I'll tell you what, I, you know, my whiskey journey, uh, you know, I, because I liked whiskey for, I got to go through, I've got one of those uh, uh, totes of back when we used to just take photos and stuff like that. We didn't, we didn't have digital in that when I was going to college and stuff, which is actually, I, I think a good thing. Uh, but I've got, uh, I've got uh, photos. I got to, I got to dig through that and go through all those photos and pull out, uh, you know, me drinking bourbon. Cause I always, always drank bourbon. My buddies were beer guys, but I always drank bourbon. And I always like to say you, you were really a, a, a moment in my, in my bourbon journey where I, I started to realize that, you know, craft can be a really great thing. And, you know, I, when, when you came out with your rye and again, you know, as, as a guy who, who, you know, uh, always drank the heritage brands, uh, you know, before this craft explosion, you, you get trained on, you know, it's older is better and age statements and all, all the stuff and only the big guys can do it well. And then when I tasted your whiskey for the first time, I was blown away and uh, it was really a cool moment and it and really helped change. Uh, I think the company, I think the company pivoted after, after talking to you, cause we we're always about, let's talk to the big guys, let's track down the big guys. And, you know, we, we talked to you, uh, uh, that was actually the first time you were on a podcast and, uh, and, and then we changed, we were like, we love everything. Everybody. We don't, we don't just love the big guys. We love the big guys, but we also love what's going on in craft. And, and you were really a big part of that, man. So thank you much for, for all you've done. Hey, we've had, uh, had a little bit of fun on a few podcasts we've had. I think we actually did a whole week at the distillery once. Yeah. Yeah. I did a whole week, which was fun. Uh, yeah. We had, had a lot of fun there and yeah, I've been by and uh, we had you in our uh, movie too. We featured, uh, you know, came by and did uh, Peerless in the uh, Kindred Spirits, the movie that we did. So, yeah, we got a great partnership for sure. So, loved, uh, love watching what you guys are doing and, and the company grow and uh, coming out with uh, the ride and the bourbon. Very, very cool stuff. So, tell us a little bit, though, about yourself. How did you get in this business? Well, I'm kind of the black sheep within the distilling community. So many are lifelong enthusiasts or they're part of a heritage where they are almost a birthright to be able to become a distiller. And uh, I grew up on a dairy farm with uh, really no alcohol culture, no appreciation, no understanding. I mean, it, uh, dairy farmers don't really have a whole lot of time to uh, get intoxicated. So <laughs> I uh, grew up observing uh -huh. a different line of, uh, line of work. I'll put it that yeah. way. Uh, but when I was in college, I was fascinated with biology and chemistry and physics. And I, uh, I just became enamored with the process of distilling alcohol, of creating it. The, uh, I mean, there's semesters of biology taught about going from grain to alcohol. And in the uh, heck of, there's so much that you can analyze as far as the way you move energy through the system within that steel room. I mean, it just, it's, an, it's fascinating. Yeah, uh, it was something that every time I'd go to try to understand it, uh, I continually stump myself and continue to fall back and uh, just make another climb at trying to learn. And then I'd fall back again. And it was just something that I, uh, I don't think anybody ever truly understands. And that's what I love about it. Uh, I yeah. like to say that it's an art built on science. So yeah. when I uh, when I knew that this was something I wanted to do, I attended Moonshine University. I uh, started shadowing different people within the industry, uh, trying to work my way under the right arms and wings. And uh, I had some amazing people in my life who were blessings to me, who uh, taught me and showed me and uh, allowed me to shadow them and kind of become an apprentice. And they recommended me to a young startup distillery called Kentucky Peerless. Uh, when we were in the finishing the demolition phase, getting ready to start building it up. And, uh, it what started off as sawing and stacking lumber and doing general grunt work around the place uh, turned into laying out steam lines and then it was fermenters and uh, cooling coils and then it was the steel and before it was over I was actually uh, programming the PLC that actually aids the distillers and making our spirits. And, so and you was, drew uh, you drew on the dairy farm stuff for that though, right? You, you the equipment and that you were you were kind of used to using very yeah. similar equipment on the farm, and it kind of helped well, you really really help dairy out. farms. And they're used to Wisconsin and uh, six hundred or thousand head of cattle and maintenance crews on staff and everything else. Uh, we had uh, mom, dad, me, uh, <laughs> grandfather, and uh, on again, off again, working like that was it. And more right. often than not, mom and dad were tending to the herds, and it was actually me and my grandfather who are doing the uh, heavy lifting, if you will, as far as the repairs and the maintenance. Right. One of the cool things, though, ultimately ends up the fact that even though this was a historic brand, a brand that had been around a long time, had some actually pretty good success, but it yeah. did go away. And as they come back, they, it's not like they've got, you know, family recipes. We got to recreate this or here's the profile we're going for. You kind of had a clean slate, didn't you? Oh, it's the best thing in the world for me. Right. right. Uh, so the in some ways, the enemy of innovation is success. It 
allows you to become complacent. You're not really pushing. You're not uh, climbing. You're not uh, looking to reinvent yourself if you are already uh, successful. And betraying that success would be to deviate. Uh, so for us, there was nothing. Uh, we had a reputation to uphold. We had the peerless name. We had this really powerful legacy uh, dating back to 1889 all the way to the start of Prohibition that uh, was synonymous with making this extremely high quality spirit. Well, uh, while we didn't have any antique recipes, we did have this antique promise, this uh, uh, artisanry to uphold. So we were able to draw on a lot of my experiences in industries of the crew or experiences of the crew within the industry, uh, looking at different mash fields, looking at different uh, ways of mashing, looking at different ways of aging and blending and distilling. And uh, the majority of it, I was able to pull from my experience going around the industry and shadowing people and uh, we kind of Frankenstein together all these different practices that we thought would make a better spirit. Yeah. And to your credit, you know, you, you make the spirit and, and really, uh, again, as, because you're coming out with something that's, that's younger than we're used to and, you know, different, and it comes out and it just kind of blows a lot of people away. Like myself. I, I mean, I want to put myself in that thing. I, I try this. I'm like, Whoa, this is really good. I became instantly became a fan and you guys do some really cool things too. Yeah. yeah. You're really at the top of your game when it comes to, you know, the gift shop picks and, and going through and noting flavor profiles and, and, and really kind of summarizing that with the name of it. And, uh, and, and so you really find some unique things, don't you? Our single barrel program is amazing. So, mm -hmm. and it's not limited to just the gift shop. It's what we see within the market. Right. When we, uh, the way we do our picks is it all starts with grading. When we're looking at a barrel population, myself, John Wiggle, who's our single barrel curator, uh, Nick Cleese, our morning distiller, and usually we're the panel of three that go through and taste every barrel. We're going to go through and evaluate first off, is this ready to be peerless? Right. And if it's not, it's a simple proposition. It goes back in the rickhouse. We don't touch it for uh, probably nine or 10 months. And then we'll review it for maybe in another year. Um, but the ones that aren't ready, they're not ready. We don't touch it. Ones that are ready, it's okay. We think this can be peerless. We have to determine which peerless it is. Ones that are amazing role players, maybe they have a great caramel nose, or maybe they have a leather uh, that's in the mid palate or a thick mouthfeel or a great there's something amazing about it, but for whatever reason, we're not comfortable with it being a single barrel. Maybe while it has that beautiful nose, maybe it's a little dull in mouthfeel, or maybe the finish was short, even if it did have that great palate. Ones that for whatever reason, we're not comfortable with being a single barrel. Those are ones that become our small batch. And what we're able to do there is build upon the strengths of each individual barrel that goes within. That great nose is going to bring up the quality of that great finish, brings up the quality of that great mouthfeel, and you end up creating a whiskey it's better than any barrel that went into it mm -hmm. now in contrast occasionally we do come across ones that are phenomenal that have the basis covered as far as it's technically sound but it's not enough for that if it was a technically sound barrel that was kind of boring as far as the flavor profile we go ahead and mingle that too but the ones that showcase really special notes from around the flavor wheel uh, maybe it does have that caramel nose while having all the bases covered Maybe it has in that rich leather or peppermint or spice or sorghum or molasses. There's something about it that is just blows you away. So these barrels, what we're going to do is we'll promote them into our single barrel program. And the store picks, the gift shop picks, the enthusiast picks, uh, uh, everyone is pulling from the same grouping of barrels. Uh, so what we'll do is when we do a selection, we'll pair three very different barrels together. Uh, we curate them. And what we do is we allow someone to pick from barrels that are all maintaining a high level of consistency and flavor and quality. I'm sorry, and quality, but we deviate sharply when it comes to flavor. Uh, that way I saw someone note a ooey gooey butter cake. That was one of your local picks right, there. Right. Was, yes. Uh, yeah. Pretty good if I remember. Oh yeah. We still I'm talk about that. When I, 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 you somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was amazing for sure. Yeah. So that yeah. is how we handle our single barrel program. The vast majority of them are going to go out into the field, but the ones that we do in house, yes, we give them uh, cool names that are uh, kind of evocative of the experience we get when we're tasting and evaluating and uh, really determining why we think this is a single barrel. We almost justify it with that ox label. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So tell us a little bit about the whiskey that we're going to be trying tonight. It's a rye coming in at 111.1 .1 proof, my friend. Yeah. So this is our standard rye whiskey. Uh, we have uh, 
stepped up to the point where we no longer have an age statement, meaning that we're primarily pulling barrels that are six and five and a few that are four, uh, mingling those together. And this is going to follow all of those hallmark practices that have really become the core foundation of what uh, Peerless is about. Uh, utilizing that sweet mash roots, that sweet floral beer, uh, distilling at an extremely low proof so we can be very aggressive harvesting as much uh, corn and grain and floral and oh, all these different notes. Uh, then when we did go into the barrel, we use the low barrel on proof of 107 and then serve everything at barrel strength. So this particular batch is at 111. Uh, the one that I'm actually trying to night is 109.6. Okay. Every one of these labels have to be custom printed because no two batches are going to be alike. Exactly. We try to be as yeah. consistent as possible in uh, quality. But again, there's going to be a slight variation because we're doing everything ourselves. Everything's made under our roof. And uh, we're doing usually around 20 barrel batches or fewer on average. Nice. Uh, Barry says a field of wildflowers. I mean, man, it is very good on the nose for sure. Let's try this last, last one of the night. So cheers gang on this. Cheers. Here we go. Cheers. Oh yeah. Very, very, very good stuff. So excellent. Question at the bottom on batch size. Yeah. On average, we're 20 barrels or fewer. Uh, when we start the process, we have a few more barrels in to build the volume of the tank. And as we deplete it, it's going to be fewer barrels. But on average, it's 20 or fewer. And the mash bill you don't talk about, right? So that's a that's a proprietary thing, correct? As per Corky Taylor, that is something I, I cannot share. I, I know. I, I, the yeah. tops if I could, because... <laughs> <laughs> a certain amount of pride in knowing that you could share the recipe, but someone may not be able to replicate it. Right, right. So we're, we we do not put you on the hook. You you're allowed to maintain that because we want you to keep your job and keep making us good whiskey like this. So yeah. please, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, what else are you guys getting on the taste on this one? There's there's plenty going on there. I like how you staged this where we're constantly moving up in proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, great bubble. Uh, gum yeah it definitely has some grape notes in there for sure and it is sweet enough where you can get the say it's like bubble gum some baking spices yeah that's that's certainly there uh Notice the common theme here is most rye whiskeys are on the hook with this big spice bomb it's a uh, yeah. bold point of edging on harshness we want to set out to make what we call a bourbon drinker's rye uh where we're pulling in a lot of the complexity that you're used to seeing within a uh, bourbon where it has uh, the sweetness, the florals, the citruses, the uh, different baking spices that are typically a little bit more delicate. And it's still anchored in the fact that it's rye, but it complements those notes. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Adam Stumpf notes that he's getting a little coffee on the finish here, especially after he exhales. So, and he notes that he loves it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I get it. Cereal, apricot, sorghum on the nose. Yeah. It is really, really fantastic. Uh, I like it. Well, Caleb, just like everybody else, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, again, being an all-star, sharing some great whiskey with us, we really appreciate it, my friend. No problem. And if y'all have any questions, I think we're about to open up the floor for that. We are. We are. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to open up your mic, ask away. And uh, yeah, we would like to, you can ask for everyone if you like, or you can pick out one of our guests individually. If you'd like to ask a specific question to any of our five distillery representatives here tonight, that, that's okay by us. Caleb. Yes, go ahead. Where's Corky? Uh, he's, he's probably at home, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, he's home. Uh, he's probably asleep by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's when you're the boss. Yeah, well, that's when you're the boss. You don't have to do these kind of things. Yeah, no. I'll tell you what, though. A, a Corky Taylor tour where he kicks that thing off telling the family history. As we talked about, you know, Adam Stumpf and the, the still as being one of the things you got to see. I think that's a, on the must list of things to do. A, a, a Corky Taylor started tour. I, I just think it's it's something that you need to do. That family history is like no other and uh, he's got some great stories and he just does a great job. So that's that's on your to-do list. If you have really to gets wound up and it does happen pretty often. Uh, you, you better take a stool in there. He can, he can go 45, 50 minutes about that. <laughs> never miss a beat. So uh, yeah, be prepared. If you want the Corky Taylor treatment, you're getting the Corky Taylor treatment. Yeah. So, Caleb, I'm always oh, shocked. Volume two, right? 
What was that? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm getting it, it, it Steve, a little bit, but that sounds like a volume two audit item, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, that's my book, uh, my book, uh, Bourbon Assignments. Uh, please check it out on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> gives you things to do at a distillery. And Peerless is featured in there. So check it out for sure. And I, I'm sure we got the Corky yeah. Taylor tour in there. So I check it out. Make it so, so, Caleb, I'm always surprised at the notes you get on a rise. It, how do you guys make it so oh, unique? Yeah, like I've never had citrus flavors and uh, like the orange truffle that you had. And, you know, I was lucky enough to be a, a part of the gooey butter cake pick. Um, I, uh, and it just never ceases to amaze me because I never get those flavors at other rides. What do you lend that to? I, I don't know if it's attainable to by saying it's just one thing. I mean, uh, we take a holistic approach here where we're going to start with our sweet mash, our grain selection, controlled fermentation, low distillation, low barrel entry. No, we like to store the like the way all we that collectively. Control. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah. The way I say it is there's no one link that can make a chain strong. It's each individual step all the way through that we feel makes the uh, core flavor of Kentucky Peerless, whether it be bourbon or rye. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. So keep it up. There you go. Thank you very much, Jim. Other questions? Yeah, I got a question for you. You mentioned uh, your guys' sweet mash regiment. And uh, I was just curious, like, how you guys define that. Uh, you know, at my distillery, we do a, a minimal version of sour mash. It's only 3% back set edition. But I'm trying to wrap my head around what folks in the industry who, you know, do sweet mash, you know, regard it as. Uh, I really That's don't have an exact percentage breakdown as far as at what point it stops being sour and starts being sweet. Yeah. Uh, I can find the far ends of the spectrum where if you use a substantial portion of back set, you're going to have those flavors. If you have very little, oh, he's fine. Let him talk to you. It's all good. <laughs> hey, <laughs> he's more important here than I, anyone on this screen is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but yes, the far ends of the spectrum is going to be if you use substantial amounts of back set, sour mash. If you use none, it's sweet. Uh, I'd actually be curious to hear Greg's proposition as far as where he would draw the line, given that he's had such a uh, storied career. Greg, any uh, there, thoughts on so, that? Yeah, there, there's so many undefined. Uh, it's kind of like small batch. You know, what defines a small batch, right? Uh, I, I think Caleb hit it, hit it right on the head. I mean, basically, from to me, my definition of a sweet mash is you don't use any back set. Okay. Right. And, and it, it's, it's crazy. Like when I was at wild Turkey, a good example, you know, we'd always shut down during the hot months because we didn't have the cooling coils and the fermenters. And so, you know, the, the temperature of the fermentation would get so high and start getting off yeast. It would just, you had terrible yields. And so that's why wild Turkey historically always shut down July August and, and half of September until the Kentucky River cooled down enough and, and that was the chill water basically we used. So when we'd start back up, you know, the first three days were all sweet mashes because we, we didn't have any backset to start the mash. And so uh, now we, we actually barreled that with a different stencil. Uh, so we knew that and, and it was definitely a different taste profile. We really? kind of blended it in later on down that's road, interesting but. that's really interesting actually. yeah that kind of gets um, at the heart of what lenny's looking for he, he brought this up on one of our shows the other day lenny's a frequent uh yeah, guest host on there so we bring him on and he's wanting to know our thoughts on sweet mash and then he i don't think he liked the answers because he's like you guys aren't professionals uh so now he gets to talk to some pros and, and, and uh, yeah well, you know and, and again I've, I've always been kind of partial to sour mash because that's kind of what i grew up with but sure. i gotta tell you i mean what, what caleb's doing you know, what, what uh, Pat Heist and, and Shane Baker are doing a Wilderness Trail. I mean, their, their sweet matches are phenomenal. They, they really are great. Yeah. You know, I, I wasn't going to ask any questions earlier, but I will. I have the, the floor, Steve. I would like to congratulate all these young distillers because he's a new guard coming up, man. I, I you know, I, I got to, to live <laughs> and, and hang out with, with the old guard and, and be a part of that. But uh, these, these young guns are phenomenal. They're doing a great job, and, and uh, they're going to take this industry long into the future. So congratulations, guys. And we do have a, a pretty young crew on here tonight on our All-Stars. So, yeah, yeah it's pretty pretty, pretty cool. And, and, yeah, they're all doing great things. They're all making their mark on the industry, which is a cool thing to say. So, sure, yeah, sure. I, I, they're, they're all doing great for sure. And Lenny can be thrown in there too. So even though he's an in-betweener, <laughs> he's, he's closer to my age, but uh, he's, a, he's an in-betweener. Hey, can I answer your question for Craig? Uh, so right now your stuff is sourced, correct? I'm sorry? 
right now your stuff is sourced. Is that correct? Our bourbon, our bourbon is yeah. Actually, our, our rye, um, Jim is is uh, is actually a part of our collaborative relationship with with Bardstown Bourbon Company. So our rye was actually produced at Bardstown Bourbon Company. Well, yeah, my, my question for you is like, so you had a lot of fifteen year old in what we tasted, and that was fantastic. As as your stuff comes of age. Are you going to maybe take like the whistle pig approach or do like a farm stock where you're doing some of your stuff with some older whiskey to keep that profile? Or are you just going to, when you hit a certain age, just make it your own? You know, it's, it's tough right now. The, the age, <laughs> age bourbon market is, is tighter than it's ever been. And uh, I mean, you can buy some, some young bourbon at an outrageous prices. So, um, you know, that, that's to be seen. Like I said, our, our first, our oldest bourbon that we've laid down back in 2018 will be four years old come August of next year. Uh, again, I taste it every six months and, and what we're doing with the barrel, and I don't want to get off on a, on a sidetrack because I'll talk all night. But <laughs> a lot of the things that we're doing with the barrel create so much more flavor for extraction. I, I don't believe in accelerated maturation. What I do believe in is if you take full advantage of the flavor that that white oak barrel has to offer and convert, convert all that hemicellulose and lignin into the caramel and vanilla flavors. you got so much flavor, more flavor to extract in the same amount of time. It still takes time and temperature changes in that barrel. But if you have more flavor there to extract, you're going to pull out more flavor. So, Fair enough. Absolutely. Other questions? Don't forget, too, we've got our January ones. Uh, we're taking reservations for now. Justine's in the process of collecting the bottles from those uh, on the January events. And, uh, of course, this is one of three. Don't forget because uh, the way we have to set up Eventbrite, we set up one event and it's the next two weeks. So you guys are all with me the next two Thursdays coming up. So don't forget that. Of course, normal emails will go out in the morning and uh, 30 minutes before, but uh, don't, don't forget uh, and book yourself on something else. And, but if you do, we record them like we always do. Other questions? Got time for a couple more. We want to keep on track. We always like to respect the 90 minute thing. We did have an extra one tonight. So a little bit less time individually, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask it now. Steve, I have a question. Sure, uh, go ahead, Brad. For all the students of the Moonshine University, did you ever skip class to go drinking? <laughs> and Greg Snyder, as a uh, teacher, what did you do when you caught your students drinking? That's part of the course, actually. So <laughs> there you go. You don't have to skip class. <laughs> you don't skip class because you drink during the day. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wanted to confirm that. That's all. Okay. <laughs> all right. I actually tell a fun story on myself. So when I actually took the course, I was already determined, like, I want to be a distiller. I want to do this. And again, it was very much from the nerdy uh, standpoint of me loving how it all comes together and having a passion for mechanical systems of all things. But when I took the course, I'll be perfectly honest. It was fake it till you make it. I didn't have a good palate. I didn't have an appreciation for whiskey or the spirits. It was take a sip and just smile and nod, smile and nod. <laughs> I was not getting everything that I was supposed to be getting at that phase, but I've been amazingly blessed with some really good and patient people who really helped me train my palate as we went. And uh, it's been everybody from different distillers and uh, sensory experts all the way to people doing store picks for uh, uh, different amazing liquor stores that really helped me fine tune my palate. But when I went through that course, I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Just a side note to that, Caleb, if, I, if you don't mind, I, uh, um, Pete Kamer was the, the primary instructor in that course, was he not? He was. Believe it not, Pete and I started the very first day at Seagram's together. Uh, in, you know, when we started in the industry, the very first day we, we started Seagram's together. So just a little side note. Wow. Very cool. Other questions? We've got just a couple minutes left. Anybody got any other questions? Hey, I don't really I just have want to go. No, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Barry. So I really didn't have a question, but I just want to share. Um, yeah, it's this whole group uh, pushing the envelope to do different things. I mean, Royce, you know, your moonshine and coming on with a brandy tonight. Adam, you know, your sweet corn and some of the other things that you've done and, and you know, bringing a straight weeder. But I, all of you here tonight have pushed the envelope beyond what normal people do. And it's not all the people that appreciate it because a lot of them look for the mainstream stuff. But I, I think this whole group here appreciates difference and we're looking for complexity and differences in the product. And without you guys, we wouldn't have it. So, yeah. I, I mean, I just, I just want to say thanks for pushing it out there and, and keeping up that fight to go along with it. So. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. 
uh, the folks here are making a difference in this industry, and it's it's cool. We're we're shuttering in a, a new time in, in bourbon, and the, we got some of the leaders of that oh, going on right here right now. How do I turn this off? Uh, Dave, did uh, you have a question? Well, I had a question, but I, I think I'm going to go to Bear's house and drink. There you go. Uh, <laughs> look at that bar behind him. Hey, you know, I I was just going to throw out some of, some of the comments and and some of the conversation. Uh, you know, you know, Steve for the for the network, maybe, uh, and I'll be the first to sign up. Uh, maybe there's a pallet series because um, I could use I could use all the education on that that I could get. And uh, I love hearing all the all the tasting notes and all the uh, uh, you know all the comments and and uh, I kind of also like hearing that uh, there's people that don't have a refined pile <laughs> pallet. So I'll raise my hand to that one. We can work on that. Well, there's there's big news coming out, big thing coming on in April, and uh, we'll we'll talk about that soon. Not ready to talk about that just yet, but uh, something along the lines of what you're talking about. So really fantastic, really cool, oh, big I'm thing. I'm not trying to break any secrets. I didn't know about it. Big, big <laughs> thing coming up in April. So uh, yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll 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 get with you on that, and and yeah, we may look even more laser focused to what you're talking about at a later date too. So that sounds good. We got time for one more, one more question. We'll end it. Does anybody have that final question? Nobody. Okay. That's all right. Uh, again, I will send a uh, email. I'll uh, get that going either later tonight. If I get the opportunity to do so, if not, you'll get it first thing in the morning. Uh, in that email, we'll have a link to the uh, recording. If there's anything you wanted to go back and see, of course, it's for the folks that couldn't make it tonight. I'll have a link to the uh, January events. Got some good ones lined up and uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the next couple of weeks. Should be fun. So looking forward to that with that. We'll say goodbye. Uh, we re like to respect our guests' time. Uh, we could talk to them for hours and hours. I get that, but we want to allow them to get back in with their families and things like that. So we'll say goodbye. I'll stick around. Uh, I'm available for questions or anything like that. And anybody who wants to stick around, they certainly can do so. But we'll say goodbye to our audience that's watching here. And let's say thank you and give uh, a round of applause thanks. for our thank presenters. You, love you all. I love you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. I love Bye. you. Bye. Thank you all. Absolutely.